So after my uh, tour of duty as a U.S. Army officer, I went to the CIA and worked there for the 27 years. Uh, 27 years in the real CIA. And it's all about this second CIA that President Harry Truman never intended to create. It's an accident of history that the CIA would be involved in overthrowing government. Oh, sorry, we don't say that anymore. What do we say about overthrowing? What do we use? What, what phrase? Right, regime change. After World War II, when Truman wanted this one agency, uh, the director of which he could call up and say, look, you have two universities worth of specialists out there in the woods of Virginia. I want you and the best three you've got to come down and brief me at two o'clock this afternoon on a major policy issue that I have to give the uh, president advice on at seven this evening. Uh, an agency that had no access to grind, that was not subservient to the Pentagon, was not under the State Department, an agency that could tell it like it is. Uh, when the OSS, the forerunner of our spy agencies, came back from World War II, uh, they, they came back to well-deserved applause. Okay, these people, these men and women, were incredibly courageous, they were imaginative, they performed miracles behind the lines in Europe and in Asia. And they were expert at overthrowing governments or paying off political parties, or whatever it took. And so they said, well, thanks for the applause, but uh, uh, should we stay around? You need us? Now, this is 1947, huh? Russians had already over, overtaken Eastern Europe, threatening Italy and France, uh, the Balkans, the KGB, the secret police running all over the, the world, and so the question answered itself, yes, we need you. Fair enough, okay. But then some idiot, <laughs> and I used the term advisedly, they said, hey, we're, we're creating this CIA for analysis, tell the president what's going on, and so th some of that's gonna be secret because they're gonna have their own spies to collect information, so let's put, let's put all these covert operators, these overthrowers of government, let's put them in, uh, yeah, let's put them in with the analysts. So we had a structural fault from the very beginning. And Truman bemoaned this before he died. He said, I didn't intend to have a CIA agency that, that uh, overthrew governments and did all this kind of stuff overseas, assassinations and everything else. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we had a fairly decent operation of telling the truth to power telling it like it is to various presidents during the term I was working there for 27 years, almost up to the very end, okay? And we had nothing to do, we were hermetically sealed off with this, from this second CIA, which to my great regret ended up, well, kidnapping, torturing, building black prisons for eavesdropping, and doing all manner of things that violate our constitution, violate our laws, or like human decency, okay? So, I wanna make clear that uh, it was in the former, it was in the CIA that uh, President Harry Truman intended that would be not only all the things I just mentioned, but when I say the inbox, we would have access to, theoretically at least, all the information available to the US government on a given issue or subject or country, that's why Central, Central Intelligence Agency. The concept is great. I don't, uh, don't hold any brief for how it was corrupted. Now, there were things that I didn't learn in graduate study or even while working for the government. I only learned picking up the last sort of decade or 12 years or so uh, when I've been speaking about or out about our foreign policy. And one has to do with uh, what George Kennan, now George Kennan was the ambassador of the Soviet Union, the author of The Containment, he, he's a really bright guy. And he used to be my idol, you know, ambassador to Russia, and he, he just was really top notch. But now I find out that after the war, when we became pretty much by accident, in my view, the sole remaining superpower in the world, okay, that's when it happened, guys, you know. Russia was destroyed. Everybody else significant was destroyed. We escaped most of that, see? So we were in control of pretty much, well, you'll see. Here's, a, here's a, a statement that I dug out. The first policy planning um, document of the new policy planning council in the State Department, uh, it was written by George Kennan, who is the, the director of the policy planning council. 
and it set our foreign policy at the end of the war. Um, you'll see that it, uh, it appears a, a little uh, bald-faced here, but I think you'll recognize it as setting the principles for our approach to the world after we became the sole remaining superpower in the world. So I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, there we go. So what we have to do really is, uh, we, can't be, we can't be sentimental about this or, uh, or deceive ourselves that we can be altruistic. Um, vague, unreal objectives like human rights and the raising of living standards and democratization. You know, we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts by and by, and we ought to recognize that right off the bat. Wow. So that set the tone, folks. Now, we're no longer 50% of the uh, are we now? Uh, anybody know? Maybe 40 or so. Uh, how about uh, percent of population? Anybody know? Five. Yeah, okay. So the disparity, the discontinuity, what Kenan calls uh, uh, the disparity that we need to maintain is pretty much in place, but we're no longer unchallenged and we're gonna to have to change because this is not gonna work over the long term. I'll just show one more, one more slide on this. It's uh, Justice, uh, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Can everyone see that? So he's making a pretty important point here. That for good or ill, the government teaches by its example. breeds contempt for law if it breaks laws. To declare that government may commit crimes would bring terrible retribution. Now, that's a long time ago, uh, early 1900s. Um, now we don't worry about past crimes. Now we just look ahead. We don't look behind. You know, we want to start afresh. We, People torture, or people is we don't worry about that, we just look ahead. Well, that's really the road toward, toward uh, chaos, in my view. The onboard camera of this attack helicopter is targeting a group of people in a neighborhood in Baghdad. Among them are two journalists from a news agency, Reuters. The photographer, Nami Nu Eldon, and his assistant, Said Hamiga. The men can neither see nor hear the helicopter that is stalking them. It is too far away. The pilots mistake Nor Eldon's camera for a weapon. And attack them. Scenes that resemble a video game, but what you see here is real, real people. The pilots are laughing, making macabre jokes. The Apache gunner is still targeting the heavily wounded Reuters employee Saad Hamiga. He will not survive. Later, the Pentagon investigates the incident and concludes that Sharper pilots had done nothing wrong. The attack was part of a combat operation. It was justified because earlier American soldiers had come under fire by insurgents. It was precisely for this reason that Manning joined the army. He said he wanted to fight for the good, but during the Iraq war he apparently started to have doubts. As an intelligence analyst, he had access to secret military files including the video with the disturbing scenes. The video shows how Reuters employee Saad Hamiga is struggling for his life. He survived the first shots fired from the attack helicopter. The pilots are still keeping track of him. Meanwhile, Salim Atasha Tumal and his two small children, Sayad and Waha, are on their way to school. From his van, he sees the wounded Reuters employee lying on the curb. Tomal stops the car, gets out to help him. His two little children remain in the front of the van. The pilots request permission to shoot, again and again. The father 
driver is unaware of all of this. He does not even notice the helicopter above him. Tomala wants to rush the wounded Reuters employee to a hospital. His compassion will seal his fate. Even when the soldiers realize that they have shot children, they only hesitate for a moment, then make cynical remarks from the air. <coughs> Since that day, U.S. Army soldier Ethan McCord has been heavily traumatized. He still cannot get the images out of his head. As an Army infantryman, he was one of the first soldiers on the scene. When he arrives at the van, he hears the five-year-old girl scream. So I grabbed the girl and I took her into uh, the house um, behind the van um, with a medic and we were cleaning her up and what I did is um, <coughs> I took my gloves off and, and was pulling glass out of her eyes so that she can blink without cutting her eyes. Then McCord runs back to the van to check on the boy. The child is still alive, but badly injured. He carries the boy back to the medics as well. As his superiors observe this, they vehemently order him to stop saving the children. Instead, he should do his job and secure the area they command. Another thing that bothered me was the fact that uh, I was the only one to care enough, it seemed, for the children to try to ensure that they get medical attention. Former Army officer Ray McGovern is shocked by the actions of the pilots. He had been a CIA analyst for 27 years and an advisor to seven presidents, including George Bush Sr. How could anyone justify shooting up that man, shooting up the person who was crawling onto the curb? These are war crimes, pure and simple. When I learned to be a soldier and officer in the US Army, I learned that you don't shoot at civilians, you certainly don't shoot people trying to rescue the wounded, and you don't blow up vans with a couple of children. For seven years, Ethan McCord had fought proudly for his country. I didn't pull the triggers that day. I didn't, um, I didn't shoot people. I didn't shoot those people on the ground. Um, but it, me being a part of the system that is doing that to the people of Iraq um, is disgusting and it hurts. And um, it, I was. Uh, after that day, I was, it was really hard for me to justify being in Iraq and being a soldier. And uh, I would never be a soldier again uh, for the American government. It's, it's too dirty. I'd like to suggest that we leave the lights off and just stop what we're doing, even what we're thinking, if that seems appropriate. And take a whole minute. A whole minute just to be quiet. Reflect, if you will, on, on what you just saw. I've seen it a number of times, it's still very hard. Um, we probably know, well, all of us, that Bradley Manning has been held in confinement, eight months of which were solitary confinement, which the UN Wapatura <coughs> for torture said was, if not torture, then certainly cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. That's what the Convention Against Torture says. Uh, that's what Ronald Reagan pushed for. That's what the first George Bush signed into law, the UN Convention Against Torture. Some of you took the same oath that I did as an army officer to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic? What does that mean in this context? And what does it mean? I, I checked with the lawyers. Uh, that oath has no expiration date. And many of us, you don't have to be an officer in the army, many of us have sworn that oath. So when we see the fourth and the fifth and se several other amendments being just kind of discarded, made, made quaint and obsolete, then you know we have a choice. We stand by our principles or do we risk do we risk ourselves in, in, a, in an attempt to tell our co-citizens, you know, this is really, really serious?